Welcome to my wacky world of fretless bass. As you can see, this is out of the ordinary for an instructional video, but at the same time, we're going to be steeped in tradition. We're going to learn to play the fretless bass in tune. Seems to be a big problem these days. We're going to start very basically working on octave intonation and progressively more complicated intervals. We're going to work our way into chords. We're going to work on some advanced techniques. Artificial harmonics. Thumb position. We're going to work on our right hand. Alternation of fingers, good plucking techniques. Our left hand, we're going to be concentrating on a lot of uh, consistency and a, and a good solid method to keep you in tune to the whole instrument. We're going to play with some great friends of mine who play really loud but really good. Carl Verheyen on guitar, Joel Taylor on drums. We're going to have a lot of fun studying the instrument and we're going to find new ways to use a vegetarian pizza or just one slice of vegetarian pizza. Above all, we're going to have fun, and at the end of this, we're all going to be better off, and we're going to be in tune with those that we're playing with. Here's some notes to tune to, E, A, D, D, G. And if you have a six string, C. And a low B. Here I sit with a four string fretless bass. Um, what we're going to get into initially is just a good left hand fingering system. Uh, one that will 
enable you to play in tune on all areas of the fingerboard and just give you good consistent fingering techniques for playing octaves in tune, for playing fifths in tune. Um, my concept of how to study intonation starts with the intervals that are easier to hear in tune. And for me, the octave, out of tune octaves or in tune octaves are the easiest things to hear. One thing you might want to do is play these octaves and purposely detune them a little bit and hear what one sounds like flat and hear what it sounds like sharp. And using this fingering system of one finger per fret or absence thereof um, facilitates that. The first thing we're going to do is always turn on our metronome, but since I don't have a metronome, I hired a real drummer um, to be my metronome for the day, among other things. Uh, we'll play this first octave intonation study. One word of warning. The first few exercises are extremely boring, so you're, you're going to be bored by playing them and maybe bored by listening to them because I get tired of them, but it's very similar to if you play trombone or trumpet long notes. You know, when you warm up, you just play long tones. So this is what this is based on. You use your ears to listen for the octaves in tune. And if you get bored with that, just look around in the back at, at some basses. There's some pretty weird ones back there. And who knows, after this video, they might be for sale. I don't know. So we'll start with some basic octave intonation using one finger per fret. Less. One, two, three, four. Listen closely. F. Let the notes ring. Shift. And so on. As you can hear, um, they are just kind of tedious, but you must do this to really listen for the octave intonation. Here we are a little bit flat, here we are sharp. One key to playing fretless bass consistently is ear training, and given how much you've done, I, I don't know, but uh, you must be very conscious of hearing the waves and the pitch. Sharp. Flat. Nobody plays in tune 100% of the time. Basically, it's a, it's a percentage play. I mean, if you just start out, you might be in tune 20% of the time, 30%. What we strive to do is just make it a lot more, uh, kind of like baseball players, you know, keep, keep the percentage up. But there are three uh, processes, or three steps in the process of of correcting your intonation. The first thing you do, of course, is you play the note. Now, whatever your point of reference is, whether it's a guitar player probably playing too loud on a big D chord, or a pianist, or, or whatever, you must tune your note roughly to them, or to yourself. So, initially, you play the note, the next thing you do is you analyze that note. And this is all happens in milliseconds. You analyze, now am I sharp or flat? Okay, I'm sharp. So I'm going to roll my finger back a little bit. You adjust your fingers quickly. You, you play the note, you analyze it, and then you adjust. 
to be in tune. So let's assume that this note is, is the constant, the D. If I'm la, la, da, da. I played it, it was sharp. I rolled my finger back and actually had to slide a little bit there to get it in tune. Okay, uh, maybe I'm using my first finger. And I hit the note. That's something you hear fretless bass players do a lot, sometimes for effect. But a lot of times, it's just that hitting a note a little low, sliding or rolling your fingers into it. In the octaves we talked about, I'm rolling them. And I'm assuming that the bottom note's in tune. Now that's not always the case. You'll find a point where, where you'll do this. So it's good to just sit around and practice that and develop your ears to, to where you can hear it. Moving from octaves, the next easiest interval to hear, I believe, are fifths. And um, how many knows what a fifth is? Two, three, four, five. Root and fifth. Very prevalent in certain kinds of music. <laughs> but we'll find that... So it's the same system of exercises. Um, basically playing long tones and listening. Going up the, the same part of the neck and, um, and I'll play it slowly at first and then gradually speed up. So one, two, three, four. Let all the notes ring together. Listening very closely. Okay, I'm, I'm going to play a couple, and I'm going to play purposely out of tune, and see if you can listen to the way I adjust, because believe me, it happens all the time. Um, uh, we just get good at fooling, fooling you. sharp. I mean, it, it, it actually it could be a nice effect. But if you're trying to play in tune with a nice little f folk singer, uh, she probably won't appreciate it very much. So these exercises are designed to develop that. Um, I noticed some of you are looking at me like, how can he stretch his hands that, that far? I've got, I've got small hands. Well, they're wide, but I have short fingers. And uh, I, I found that the, the one, three, two, four, particularly for octaves and fifths like that, work for me. But some of you with smaller hands, and you've probably seen many, many uh, great musicians play one and four for octaves. And, and I have no problem at all with that. Um, and sometimes I do it, either for strength reasons or just for, for comfort. But I found that, that th once again, back to our methodical, logical fingering system. <laughs> playing octaves. Stuff like that, you would have to shift twice as many times if you're catching them one and four. And one thing that, that you'll learn and that I've learned the hard way is that the highest risk, the most risk of being out of tune is when we shift. If we stay in one position all day, Actually, you can make a lot of money playing that kind of bass and staying in one position. And there's nothing, no problem with it, but staying in one position, you can play in tune when you start to shift.
once again, the, I'm just explaining the, the most efficient way to use your fingers. The least amount of shifting results in, in probably a lot more accuracy and a lot more consistency in your uh, intonation. Use your ears, not your eyes. You'll notice I'll look down a lot to shift. <laughs> I'm still, if you're, if you're on stage playing to an audience and, and something we all want to do, I'm sure you do, um, we don't want to be staring at our left hand. I mean, not only does it take away from the show, you can't look at the other musicians for cues. There's none of that magical eye contact stuff that everybody talks about. And, and you know, you can't see all the uh, nice looking creatures in the first through 15th row, you know, if you're looking at your left hand. Another thing you'll notice when you're playing the fifths or the octaves, you notice I'm fingering one, three, two, four, one, three, two, four. Don't always get locked into that. There are other ways to finger fifths. Four, one is I'm going A, E, two, four. So why not switch and go four? It just puts a whole new perspective on keeping these consistent. Same thing with octaves. Listen closely. Listen to how easily I can play out of tune. But you just find that pocket there, and as you work your way up the neck, constantly stop and listen to yourself. Here's an exercise that's a, a what I call a combination exercise. It octaves and fists together. Uh, I think there might be a six thrown in, but this exercise looks easy on paper. But as you'll hear, it's, uh, it's more than that. A um, little, little slight backbeat, Mr. Taylor, my personal metronome. It's great. Keeps me in line and in time. One, two, three, four. Intonation is so important. I sit here on a beautiful day like this talking about intonation. It must be important. We'll ask anybody off the street. Oh, excuse me. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I, I, hate, I see you're in a hurry, but when you... Strange question, but when you go out and, and you hear a fretless bass player in a band, what, what's your main concern? Intonation. In, see? Lady off the street. That'll about do it for fifths. So what's the next logical interval to hear in tune after a fifth? Um, well, after a fifth of anything, I can't hear anything in tune anyway. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> those are fourths. Fourths. Um, fourths, you know. Basically, you can play them by barring your finger across or by playing separate notes. But without drawing things out too much here, it's the same consistent exercise, just listening. Listening to what a perfect fourth sounds like in tune, and listen to what it sounds like out of tune. You'll notice my left hand, there's an A and a D. Just the, the slight pitch of my finger changes, changes the, the, the whole intonation of the chord or whatever you're playing. So you've got to be really careful. And from the angle I sit looking down at it, it doesn't look like it's even straight. So you've got to get over the, the, uh, the visual thing of looking at it. Now, that looks straight to me, and listen to the way it sounds. Hear how it sounds when I bend it into tune? It doesn't look straight. And there it goes sharp. So you just have to play these. Uh, I'll do this one real fast. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four.
third finger. Fourth finger. And so on, up and so on, up and down the, uh, the fingerboard. Sometimes you'll facilitate them a lot better by playing them with two fingers. But play them in tune. Even if you're in the upper register, you've heard the, these kind of blues licks a lot. Hear how slightly tuning and detuning them. Here's a one position force exercise that'll uh, give your left hand quite a workout. You use all your fingers. Remember, listen, don't look too much. Uh, you'll see me looking over at my left here, and that's a trick I have. There's a music stand right here, and which leads me to another point. But if you're ever reading in the studio or wherever you're reading, if you find if you put your music slightly to the left, you're able to, with your peripheral vision, watch your shifts as well as watching the music, as opposed to you see some people looking this way, Got to look back and forth. This way you kind of kill two birds with one stone. Force exercise. One, two, one, two, three, four. Here's an exercise that com combines everything we've done, octaves, fifths, and fourths. One, two, three, four. Listen closely, in and out of tune. I was having to make millisecond adjustments in there just to keep it roughly, absolutely, almost in tune. Here's, I picked up the big bass now. It was a quick change, huh? And uh, I'm going to play a more advanced exercise utilizing fourths, fifths, and octaves, shifting around on the instrument, and, and really listen to my intervals. And I'm going to keep this D droning, which is a great thing to do. Find an open note on your bass and let it drone and tune against it. You'll be tuning the octaves, seconds, minor thirds, major thirds, fourths, fifths, flat fifths, all the notes. You learn to hear them relative to an open string or a constant pitch. So here we go with a brand new song of mine that I haven't written yet.
strange story happened to me. I was in college and I got called to go do a gig. And this just shows you the public's awareness of a fretless bass. I mean, I, I've kind of grown accustomed to it, but North Texas State University go to a gig at the I-35 Club playing in a country western band. And I had a fretless bass because it was shortly after that I ran over my other one. So I take it in there and this guy with a cowboy hat and big boots, which I have nothing against, he goes, golly, look at that thing. It ain't got nary a fret on it. And thank God I grew up in South Carolina and I understand what nary means. That it didn't have a single fret. And he said, gee, did you pay less for that thing because it didn't, don't have no frets on it? And, you know, I went to the bar and um, that story gets worse because, I mean, I'm confessing this to people. It's r stuff, rumor, there's a lot of rumors about this. But, yeah, I went out that night and, and I get halfway back to my college dorm and I keep my bass right behind my seat there and I notice it's not there. And I go s swinging over I-35 back up to Oklahoma and, uh, yeah, there's my bass laying in the parking lot with a tire track down the gig bag. And uh, before the other one ever even came back, I ran over my fretless bass. I think it had a lot to do probably with, with that club. And if that club's still around, you should visit it. Let's move on. Thirds and tenths. Now it starts to get pretty. And I'm going to switch bases while you just to show you that it can be done in real time. And uh, thirds and tenths. What's a third? A third is, and a tenth is merely that third taken up an octave. You've heard that sound a lot, I'm sure. Same principle. I know it's boring, and believe me, I have to sit through it every day because I practice it, but, but I know it helps. G to B. One, two, three, four. Listen closely. Notice my left hand fingering. Shift smooth. So on. Up and down the instrument. Thirds. Notice when they're flat what it sounds like? Hear that window of opportunity when you're in tune. Gone sharp. There it is. Played against an open string. Listen for it that way. You know, I realize that playing with expression or, or all those nuances or just being able to control whether you're in tune and out of tune and using them both together. Here's a finger buster for thirds and tenths. Stack them on top of each other. Shift. All the way up the, the neck. Just get hearing that in tune. And hearing the octaves in tune. So you hear the thirds, the B in this case, against the G and then tune the B to the low G, and then tune the B to the high G, and then tune the low B to the high G, then you tune your low G to the high B, then you tune your B to your G. <laughs> it gets kind of confusing. And then you, uh, you quit for a while. So try that exercise going up and down. There, there are variations that you'll find in the, the uh, fretless bass book uh, regarding this. Um, way to develop that third and fourth finger coordination is through uh, what I call the hazard exercise, which is a 
little exercise that, that have, I've been torturing BIT students with for a number of years now. And a couple of them have come over from other countries and said, uh, teach us your house of exercise, please. And I guess this is what they're talking about. But, but it, it's a great, uh, great warm-up exercise, and it's also great for developing uh, your third and, finger, third and fourth finger coordination. Very simple. The notes themselves aren't important, but it's what you do with your left-hand fingers. Notice my index finger stays where it ended right there. And now my middle finger stays where it is. So I end up with a contorted, painful left hand. Well, actually, it doesn't hurt anymore. It hasn't hurt for a few years now. But um, you end up de developing these fingers. So watch closely. And then I'm going to shift, and it even gets worse. Notice my fingers are staying down. Shift up to the C. Didn't miss nary a beat. And that's about the, as hard as it gets right there, because if you can keep these fingers down in that tent and come down. It looks bad on a four string. You ought to see it on a six string. It, it's... It, it, it looks painful. And you can uh, combine this with some right hand exercises, uh, rhythmic exercises, to create a great warm up. Uh, I've had many times where I've got to go on stage and do a show and I haven't had time to warm up. I'll just do this once and I'm ready to go. Minor thirds, not like the fingering we have for, for major thirds, but it's probably easier to get. Here's a G to a B flat using one and four. We're back to that fingering system again of not fingering the octaves like this, but fingering them 4, 1, G, B flat, hear the pitch there? I'm going from the minor third to the root to the minor third again, so I'm getting an octave with that third in between. Got a B natural, a G sharp, and a B natural. Once again, do them slowly and listen. Here's some major tense. My fingering is optional. I mean, one thing I believe in strongly is I, I never force any of my students or, or never demand them to finger a thing one certain way. Because depending on the shape of your hand or what kind of fingerings you've studied or how you feel that day, you're going to end up fingering things different. My philosophy is finger it every way you know how. That way you'll never get stuck in a corner. Here's some tense. One, two, three, four. I wish I'd written that song. Kind of makes you thirsty, though, doesn't it? Here's a combination of everything we've talked about so far. What has it been? It's been octaves, fifths, fourths, thirds, tenths, minor thirds. All those intervals, at this point, you should be hearing perfectly. Um, here's the combination, using them all. One, two, three, four.
What better time to talk about tents than after a 10 mile ride around the lake? Yeah, nice, nice. Listen closely. If you can hear these tents over the traffic and hear them in tune, then they're really in tune. Consistent left hand fingering, a must. Compared with open string, Six strings can add other voicings on top. Dominant, minor seven, dominant, 13th. Hey, hey, Mike. Oh, man, I'm so sorry, dude. Man, Sean said it was, it's, I got a bite just like this. I got one just like it. I, I do. The next interval, we're almost out of them, thank God, is the sixth. You know those little devices they teach you in music class to uh, identify pitches or help you remember them? This is My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. That's a major sixth. Now getting that in tune is the difference between this. Not so good. Notice the rolling action of my, my pinky. Same kind of exercise, long tones. One, two, three, four. Listen to all those. If you notice, I was doing some very microtonal adjustments in there, but, but managing to pull them into tune. Notice the fingering. One, two, one, three, two. Just like the other thirds, here's an even harder exercise. Listening to them all. Two sets of six stacked on top. G and E, D and B. Sounds like Avon calling, sort of. And then shift, sixth. Shift. That's pretty good to stack all those notes. I was lucky. The minor sixth, which is which interval? If this is my Bonnie lies over, th this is. If you want to study in six, just study that melody. It's all composed of minor six and major six. Getting to hear them in tune. It's actually, if you look at it from the top down, it's an inverted major third. A minor six down from E is the same thing as a major third up from E, G sharp. So here's a sixth exercise. One, two, three, saw. Thank you. 
It had tenths, sixths, almost everything in there. Notice I use an open string to check, check my pitch a lot. Here's a nice little song called Too Loud, Too Fast, Too Bad.
triads, combining thirds and fifths, tenths and fifths, um, just like the, the stacked fifths, uh, they, they can make life very difficult. Uh, this exercise, um, unit six in the book, if you happen to have the fretless bass book, if not, you've got it there in your little additional book. Um, this covers every interval we studied, and it's kind of a melodic exercise. Uh, some of it stolen from various composers that I, I like and various hymnals that I've stolen. Um, and it goes something like this. One, two, three, four. Let the notes ring together. Every inter interval that we've talked about is covered in that one piece. If you can master that short little exercise, your intonation has come a long way. So that kind of covers triad intonation. You can practice playing minor thirds this way, major thirds and triads this way. Really listening. And little artificial harmonics I threw in, uh, well, you can figure it out. Actually, in, in my advanced rock bass book, there's a lot of, a lot of talk about artificial harmonics and the ways to get them. Here are some scales, kind of the same concept, but on one string, kind of like what we talked about with the droning, but now we're concerned more with, sh with just shifting accuracy, not necessarily slides, but the pitch is, is altogether important. B-flat major scale. Uh, I'll do it once with extended fingerings. One and two and three and go. Just a B-flat major scale, learning it over your whole instrument. Uh, a big concern of mine is, is being able to play a major scale and start on any finger. We all get so comfortable with certain positions and this and that. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick a key like B-flat and, and spend about 20 minutes just in a B-flat major scale of doodling, as they say. Concentrating on intonation, but learning fingerboard harmony as well. <laughs> clinics, concerts, and lessons around the world.
people always ask about my right hand technique. Um, I realize you bought a fretless bass video, and this has nothing to do with fretless bass, but it, it has something to do with music, so let's talk about it anyway. I use a three finger alternating technique. Um, the whole key to that is just keeping them even. Uh, whether you're starting on your third finger, your second finger, or your first finger. No matter which direction you're going, you should have control over them. So I just practice it very slowly. Try to get them all to sound the same. It's like developing a consistent two finger pattern, but you're just throwing the third finger in there. Initially, you're probably going to have to uh, develop your third finger some because most of ours are weak. So I just do that by practicing two and three. And just getting them to sound even with the same amount of, uh, of attack and the same amount of intensity. I'll do string crossing exercises where I'll, I'll pick a, uh, like the hazard exercise we did earlier. And try to keep the... I'll play scales. whole time trying very hard to keep my right hand consistent, which uh, I found that the, through developing the three finger thing, I'm able to, to play certain things that makes certain things a lot easier, makes other things a little more difficult when it comes to string crossing. But as far as uh, playing triplets, I'll usually start three, two, one, and keep that pattern going, as opposed to going which is a great thing to do, doing it one, two, three, two, and then you're, you're accenting every beat with a different finger. Which sounds like. But using various combinations of this technique, I found that I'm able to play things faster and uh, considerably cleaner than, than when I use two, although, you know, I'm probably the exception to the rule because the, all, all the great guys I admire mainly play with two, and. Some of them even play with a pick, but not on a fretless, I hope. It's a right hand technique that I got from a classical guitarist, and you know how those guys are. They're pretty meticulous. And uh, the guy who taught me was very adamant that I alternate my fingers and uh, and I'm thankful to this day that, that, that he did do that. Here's a little etude that I wrote. Um, can be played on a four string, five string, six string bass. It all fits neatly on a four string. It combines, once again, a lot of intervals. There's a lot of suspended chords, which is the same interval we studied as a fourth, but up an octave. involving those kinds of, of shifts of not only the upper note, but the lower note. It goes something like this. One, two, three, four.
Here's a little blues ditty. Uh, lots of tenths, sevenths, sliding around. Main thing is cop the feel, that triplet kind of thing, and make your slide smooth. One thing that, that we're doing a lot now is sliding the chords and keeping the consistency of a dominant chord. Those kind of things. One, two, three, four. Combining your ears and your eyes is a great thing. There's only one other thing, one main ingredient. I shouldn't say probably only one, but it is a main ingredient. Muscle memory. The ability to play in tune consistently using your ears. Sometimes it's so loud on stage you can't hear. Then comes your muscle, muscle memory and your sight. Um, by muscle memory, I mean the the acquired technique of of being able to make shifts just because you've made that shift a hundred times. A nice uh, practice for that is to take a note. You notice I'm looking when I shift. I'm not brave enough to do it with, without that, although there have been times when I've had to, like when I'm jamming with some guys and all of a sudden somebody gets artsy and decides to turn the lights out, and then you find out what your ears and your muscle memory is made out of. Uh, other exercises are just simply... <laughs> jumping all around on the instrument, but trying to maintain your pitch center as well as making the shift extremely quick. One, two, three, four. Here's a couple more etudes from the, my fretless bass book. Um, they involve some harmonics, some more wide slides. Uh, we're up to slides of a fourth now. Which further reinforces all the muscle memory things we've talked about. And pitch, pitch. As you're doing those slides, stop yourself at any point and check your tuning with an open string. One, two. Three, play.
kind of pretty. Here's another one that fits right along with that. Once again, shifting down a fourth, up a fourth, up a third, that kind of thing on one string. Make them smooth and make your slides quick. Don't make them sound too syrupy. Major and minor thirds, tenths, all kinds of stuff in this one. One, two, ready, play. Progressing on, we find that slides of a fifth, slides of a sixth, and of a seventh, all are valuable. Slides of a fifth. I'll do that all over the instrument on various strings. I'll start on different fingers, maybe start on three. Maybe start on one. Maybe start on four. Just building that muscle memory. Whenever I think a fifth or hear a fifth, hopefully I can slide a fifth. And by then I'll probably drink a fifth. Then I'll move on to a sixth. My bum. And so on, so forth, through sevenths. Which gets pretty dramatic. Which leads to my next little topic here. It's called blending. It's a name, I, I invented the word blending. <laughs> I, it, as far as, I use the word blending referring to taking slides. When, when you see on a piece of music, it might have a, a C up to an octave C. And I mean, literally, this is what it sounds like, which is pretty dramatic unless you're playing in a circus band or, or a comedy show or something like that. So I've, I've found that, that crossing strings or even on the same string, blending. By blending, I mean blending the fingers in, so I don't have to slide from one to one. I'll slide, and on the way up, it's a very subtle thing, you might be able to hear it, but I'll switch fingers on the slide, which gives actually less, less, distance, less distance to slide. As opposed to get the full impact of the slide. It also works when you're crossing strings. Sometimes crossing two strings. Check with an open string. Close. That's a blending technique. Here's a little ditty, once again, that uh, uses some blending techniques. One, two, three, four.
Talk about getting inspired. Wow. This is a great environment to practice in, further emphasizing my point that, that you must be in the right frame of mind to really practice well and learn a lot in a short amount of time. So I figure this lift is about 12 minutes long. Uh, plenty of time to learn a lot of things. I'm listening to every note. My point is, be inspired when you practice. It doesn't have to be a, a situation like this. It can be anywhere, but your, your frame of mind has to be right. Your concentration has to be up. And in this case, you can't have a fear of heights. <laughs> a song using a lot of chords and voicings on the bass that we talked about, and it's basically called The Blues.
some special effects on the fretless bass. You hear people doing this. Something you can't do very well on a, uh, on a fretted bass is, is catch harmonics and slide. And you can slide down. You can take. So what you do is you find the harmonic and then you mash your finger down. You've got to be very accurate, but you mash your finger down over it and quickly slide up the fingerboard. Notice that wonderful left hand technique. You can actually tune while you're doing it. There's an exercise in the book, in Unit 11, that goes something like this, the bottom of the page. One, two, ready, play. probably noticed uh, I've been doing a lot of artificial harmonics and that, that like I said that's kind of covered in my advanced rock bass book but I'll give you just a, a quick lesson in that you see me do it it's an octave up so the basic principle is you find the note it's just like the twelfth harmonic you move ahead to a G sharp change your node, use your index finger or your thumb. I call it the movable nut approach to advanced or to artificial harmonics. You just got to make sure your right hand and your left hand stay proportionally an octave apart. For my right hand I use uh, my index finger as the node point like I would normally go here I can go here, use my index finger, and pluck with the two fingers behind it. Jocko used to do his with his thumb. And when I hung out with him once, I said, well, I do mine with my index finger. It seems like I can be a little more accurate. And plus, I can play chords. And that was really hard to do with his thumb. And his reply was, well, I don't want to do that. Vibrato. You've probably heard me doing it a lot today and wondering, he's wiggling his fingers and it sounds good. Vibrato is, is, is I heard our cello instructor in college say, is, is one of the hardest things there is to teach. Is probably why I haven't mentioned it yet. Um, it looks so simple. But a person's vibrato is, is, as I've also heard said, is as different as their fingerprints because everybody vibrates at a different speed or, or feels a different way to do it. Um, if there's a particular singer you really like, I mentioned Peter Gabriel, um, boy, Pavarotti, Frank Sinatra, all different vibratos. John Anderson from Yes, his lack of vibrato is, is unique and is dead on pitch. Um, all of these are, are my influences among many other horn players and everything like that. But one thing to avoid is this kind of vibrato, no matter what. You hear a lot of new fretless bass players. They're so enamored with the fact that they can finally... So they're like playing, and meanwhile the singer is, or eyes are going from side to side because there's no pitch center in the band. A nice... Hear how subtle that is and how effective it is as opposed to
finding the right place to do it. All I can say is don't make it too fast. Make it a natural motion. Practice it with all your fingers. Just kidding. Hear how all the, the pitch is pretty dead on for those two. Vibrato in a chord, a C uh, with a tenth. Very slight vibrato is detuning, is all it is. It, it's like I said earlier, musicality comes from control over being able to play in tune and out of tune. A great exercise for shifting as well as vibrato and getting from finger to finger. Finger a G with your first finger. Go to an F sharp with your fourth finger. Now why, why would you do something like that? Here's the reason, you never know when you're going to be. If you're doing a scale, doing a scale going down. Now do it to your third finger. To your second finger. Very effective ways to uh, facilitate shifts into different registers. So if you're going as you're going, you're already starting to shift. So a lot of times I'll just practice. And then I'll stretch it out, make a whole step out of it. Sets me up for a whole new, a minor third. You probably noticed that I've been using my thumb for strange and unnatural things. And you probably think, those of you that know, that, oh, he's just using an acoustic bass technique called thumb position. Well, you're right and you're wrong. Um, when I started doing that, I didn't even own an acoustic bass. What I did, I owned a precision bass that um, only had 21 frets or 20 frets or only goes up to an E flat. I can't count that high, but uh, and I had a record that had Stanley Clark on it. My first jazz record was Chick Corea's "Light as a Feather," and he was going up and hitting all these G's on his upright bass. And I went, "Wow, I don't have the range." So I took it to the luthier in South Carolina, the one and only, and he extended my fingerboard up to 24 frets. But the thing he forgot to do was cut the bass away. So I ended up with a fingerboard up to here and no way to reach it. So I'm like reaching around, get you, catching these nose, notes and my thumb is just hanging there. And all of a sudden I went, wow, it works. And then I found I could get some really, found a lot of uses for it to use the way some people would tap, you can get those kind of... It's great for playing in the upper register because if you're up here, if you're playing like this, you can kind of nail it on a fretless, but if you're over the top of the fingerboard... B flat major scale. So you're free to play as well as linearly, vertically, on all portions of the instrument. Play on this part of your thumb, Thanks for hanging in with me all this while. I hope you've had as much fun as I have and uh, hope you've learned something. The main thing, our main objective is to play in tune, to play in time, and to play with good tone. So keep that in mind. You might want to rewind this thing and start all over. Um, <laughs> a lot of stuff to get in an hour or so. So we'll see you on the next go-around, and remember, 
play in tune. Remember all the principles we talked about and stick to them. See ya. fingerboard my neck is a little bit um, sticky because I, I wanted to sat and finish on this place and put this on but this is if you don't have anything around what you can do you just you either eat the pizza and get it all over your fingers the grease and then you wipe the back of your neck or if you're not hungry you simply take the slice of pizza and you rub it on the back of your neck you caress it like this and rub some of those sweet Domino's oils into it and and, and then you eat it. No, actually, then you go up to the cameraman and say, hey, Steve, you want a slice of pizza? But what I like to do with this instrument mainly well, is play it upright, of course, in, in legitimate situations. But when I got nothing better to do and, and it's, it's just that the right time I take it out and, and I like to go out and play uh, country and western, both, both. I, I mean, I, I'm open-minded. I play country and western and I like it. Beautiful thing about Having a place up here in such a calm, tranquil environment is it, is it inspires me to uh, come up with sounds that, that fit the uh, fit nature, as it were. So I work around with different sounds, and today I, I kind of feel like this fits this calm, tranquil environment. Mm-hmm.